Ähm, willkommen zurück, welcome back. Ähm, ich hoffe, ihr hattet einen großartigen Morgen, lehrreiche Sessions, ähm, konntet euch verpflegen über Mittag. Ähm, bei uns geht es nachher weiter. Wir haben als nächstes die Keynote-Speech von Catherine Mayer. Ähm, sie ist CEO der Wikimedia Foundation. Danach findet hier auf der Bühne ähm, noch eine kleine Lightning Talk Challenge statt. Ich hoffe, meine Challengers, meine Player sind alle hier. Halt mal die Hände hoch. Ja, ja, okay, da hinten. Ja, du wirst dich dann halt irgendwie nach vorne <lacht> bewegen müssen nachher. Danach ähm, geht es weiter mit Sessions und anschließend haben wir noch die DINACON Awards, ähm, die lang ersehnten. Da haben wir 16 Nominierte, die darauf bangen, wer wohl so einen begehrten Award mit nach Hause nehmen darf. Und ganz zum Schluss gibt es noch ein Apero und eben, wie erwähnt, heute Morgen die Celebration, 20 Years Anniversary Celebration der Open Source Initiative. Gut, ähm, jetzt möchte ich gleich rüberleiten und zwar zu unserer zweiten Keynote-Referentin. Ich habe alle Infos über sie auf Wikipedia gefunden. Kein Wunder, sie ist auch ähm, eigentlich sozusagen die Chefin von Wikimedia, von der Wikimedia Foundation. Das ist die Stiftung, ähm, die sich seit Jahren schon einsetzt ähm, und äh, eigentlich die Wikipedia ähm, aufrechterhält, aber nicht nur, sondern die haben auch ganz viele andere Projekte, von denen sie heute kurz erzählen wird. Ähm, Catherine ähm, hat zuerst bei der UNICEF, dann bei der Weltbank und auch bei Access Now eigentlich ihre Karriere den offenen Gesellschaften verschrieben und, ähm, und dem sozialen Impact von Technologie. Und wir sind sehr gespannt, was sie uns heute hier so zu erzählen hat. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you. Hello, it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I think I got a little bit of an introduction just there, but I'll, I'll introduce myself anyway. My name is Catherine Marr. I am the executive director of the Wikimedia Foundation. And as you, I think I got from the laughter, most people here have used Wikipedia before. Hmm. Raise your hand, maybe, if you've never used Wikipedia before. <laughs> okay, so you're familiar with some of the things that we do. I was asked here uh, by my colleagues at Wikimedia Switzerland specifically to talk a little bit about not just Wikimedia and Wikipedia, but the open knowledge movement more generally and its impact on our societies and our hope for its future. But before I do that, I'm also going to just talk a little bit about Wikimedia and what it is that we do, because behind Wikipedia, There is a huge community of people and activity of volunteers that most people don't even know exists. It's like what happens underneath the surface of the water. So I want to tell you a little bit about that. We're going to go on a dive. So Wikipedia, of course, is the encyclopedia that anyone can edit. Uh, that was the tagline for us. Uh, we have a bold and ambitious vision to make sure that free knowledge is available to everyone in the world. And what really drives and animates our community is a belief that First of all, everyone should have access to knowledge, no matter where you are, what you where you come from, what language you speak, but also that everyone on the planet has something that they can also offer back to knowledge. That knowledge is not a static thing, it's a participatory thing that we build constantly. We're constantly creating new knowledge, our existing knowledge is being updated, and that all of us have something, some sort of unique perspective that we can contribute in a way that enriches our overall shared human understanding. So that's really the belief that animates us. It's not just an encyclopedia. It's actually a fundamental belief that there's some sort of mission in the world. And since 2001, we have been passionately focused on this vision, single-mindedly so. 2001 was when Wikipedia was created and when our community started to grow. Um, and we're going to keep going until Wikipedia exists in every language and we've run out of things to write about. But I can tell you, we're a long ways away from that. This is us today. We started in English in 2001, but very quickly grew from language to language, community to community. And today we exist in more than 300 languages and include 48 million articles. And we've been edited more than three and a half billion times over the course of our 17 year history. So it's quite large. Of course, Wikipedia itself, as you know, if you use the German language Wikipedia or the French or the Italian, 
Italian or the English, they're all different. I think that's a critical thing that most people maybe aren't aware of. So English Wikipedia is the largest. It has five and a half million articles. But then we have Wikipedias that are quite small, maybe with just a thousand articles that may represent an indigenous community's language and maybe the largest collection of written knowledge in that particular language. So when we think about what size means, we actually don't think that that's necessarily an indicator of how important a language is. It just means that we have more work to do. Even with five and a half million articles in English Wikipedia, we think estimate that there's probably a hundred million articles that should exist in the world. So there's much, much more of us that we can do. We're only about 5% of the way done. Of course, we're not just Wikipedia. Um, while Wikipedia may be the project that most people know and are familiar with, we have a number of other free knowledge projects, and I'll talk a little bit about some of them, like Wikidata in a bit, or Wikimedia Commons. But the idea behind Wikipedia was that Excuse me. The idea behind Wikimedia, and the reason we call ourselves Wikimedia instead of the Wikipedia Foundation, is the idea that knowledge is much greater than what fits in an encyclopedia. An encyclopedia turned out to be the easiest thing to start with. It's the form factor that most people were familiar with. It's a written page. It has illustrations. It's relatively easy to explain from a, as a cultural concept. But there's many other ways that we can think about aggregating knowledge from structured data to images, to video. And so that's what our Wikimedia ecosystem is really meant to do. And we're really popular, uh, as it turns out. Every single month, we receive visits from about a billion and a half devices, unique devices. I can't tell you exactly how many people visit Wikimedia over the course of a given month, because we have very strict privacy policies in place. So we don't actually track you. We don't know what it is that you're looking at. We don't know when you come back to us. We don't know how many of those 15 billion pages you specifically read. If you are reading more than a billion pages a month. I'm very impressed, by the way. Um, <laughs> but the, so we don't actually know exactly how many people we reach over the course of a month or over the course of a year, but we do know that about a billion and a half devices from all over the globe visit us every single month which we estimate to be about a billion people. So given all the folks on the internet today, we're really reaching a really significant percentage of the world's population. It also makes us the fifth most popular website on the planet, which I don't think most people realize. So num number five. It's, I think that's a really nice thing. I think it's an important thing that so many people actually love knowledge as opposed to just social media or videos of cats. Um, <laughs> I mean, I love videos of cats too, but um, but but actually, this next slide is an is an indication of the difference, perhaps, in the value proposition between a video of a cat and a resource like Wikimedia. So, this young woman standing in the middle is a woman named Neta Hussain. Neta Hussain is a doctor um, from Kerala, India, and when she was studying as a student in medical school, she found that it was very difficult for her to get up-to-date textbooks for the work that she was trying to do, and it was even more more difficult for her to be able to access textbooks in the local language in the state that she lived in. So I believe Neta is a Malayalam speaker. And so first of all, hard to get English language textbooks, they're expensive, they're out of date, and even harder to get access to knowledge in the language that she's most familiar with, her mother tongue. She found Wikipedia, she liked Wikipedia, and she started editing to improve medical articles, but then also to translate them from English into other languages to ensure that that knowledge was more broadly available. And so today, thanks to the efforts of Neta and p other medical doctors like her, there's a group called Wiki Project Med that has made 50,000 of our most important medical articles available for free to anyone to download into an app that they can take offline wherever they go. Because for every medical student like Neta, who's actually connected to the internet, you can think of all of the needs for people from a healthcare standpoint who are in rural communities and areas where they are offline, in which Wikipedia may be the only resource that they actually have. It reminds us of how much privilege we have as we sit here in somewhere like Bern, where we're widely connected and probably within 100 meters of a medical office to think of how important a resource like Wikipedia can be in many places in the world. But of course, 
the work that Wikipedia does is not just around medical students and it's not just in India, it's truly everywhere. And Wikipedians keep pushing the boundaries of what we think of when we think of what an encyclopedia can do and be in our societies. So this image is from Poland, of the Wikimedia Poland community. They hired professional ethnographers and they went into the Carpathian Mountains in order to document some of the folk traditions of those mountains to ensure that they had images and video and stories. I think this is a gentleman who's making a shoe, it looks like a shoe, um, before those traditions, they start to disappear. In Argentina, I was recently visiting our colleagues in Buenos Aires, and they've been using Wikipedia to document the history of the period in which 30,000 Argentinians were miss went missing or were disappeared by that, by that country's military regime. This is an area in which, for Argentina, this is tremendously sensitive. The whole issue of memory and forgetting and knowledge is one that is continuously part of the dialogue of the nation. And so Wikipedia is a way in which Argentinian community members are interweaving their history so that the information that is available as fact-based information is available to any student of history in Argentina as they learn about their country. In India, our colleagues have been working to digitize works in Indic languages that have historically not been available digitally. So you, as you can imagine, there's a very long written tradition in India. There are also many different language, I think, languages. The country recognizes at least 24 languages, not in an official capacity, because there are, there are so many thousands of languages, but 24 sort of primary languages. And our communities there have been working to take some of these foundational texts from their own language groups and digitize them so that they are not only available to the world, but that they're also preserved so that they are going to be available in the future for more than just uh, academics and, and librarians. And more recently in Brazil, I'm sure many of you are aware of the tragic loss of the National Museum in Rio de Janeiro. Our Wikimedians in Brazil have, been, have launched an effort to try to crowdsource images that people may have taken when they were visitors to the museum as an effort to try to reconstruct some of the lost memory. And this is something that they've been calling on not just from Brazilians, but from everyone around the world because they really see this as part of the texture and fabric of our shared human heritage. So I've spoken a lot about the rest of, oh, my slide broke. I am so sorry. <laughs> that is really embarrassing. <sighs> if it's gonna break, of course, it's the Matterhorn that's gonna do it. But, um, <laughs> um, and of course, here in Switzerland, where you have uh, in <laughs> also a diversity of languages and communities and cultures, Wikimedia Switzerland, which is our affiliate here in, in the nation, has been working to weave those communities together from across the country, bringing together the different language groups in their work united around some of uh, our efforts in integ integrating Wikipedia into education and into what we call our glam communities of galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, with the whole idea being how do we create a sort of sense of common knowledge among communities that of course are connected as citizens, but often have very distinct identities and distinct traditions that they wish to preserve. They're strengthened by this collaboration, and that's exactly the whole purpose of what we do at Wikimedia. Yes, it's about documenting knowledge, but it's also about weaving together the texture of our shared human heritage. And as you may have picked up, all of this is made possible by people. Um, of every edit that has been made to Wikipedia, the three and a half billion, we know that at least 22 million people have contributed to it over time. As I said, I don't know exactly how many people because we just don't track these sorts of things, but it is the case that Wikipedia has been contributed to by individuals day in and day out, and many of them have come by to drop in an edit or to fix a piece of information, to add a citation and then moved on, never to contribute to us again, and that's okay. It's a little bit like coming and dropping a stone in the bottom of the bucket, ultimately raising the level of the water for all. That's how Wikipedia is created. Every single month, a quarter of a million people come by and edit. And of those quarter of a million people, only about 70,000 stick around day in and day out. It's made possible by people, people like you here in this room, 
And it's a global movement of individuals. I've already referenced all these different places from Argentina to India to Switzerland. But our community is incredibly diverse. We have community members in Ghana. We have community members in Indonesia, in Japan, in Russia, in the United Kingdom. And the most amazing thing is that they are all connected by this spirit of shared open knowledge. You find people sitting together in dialogue from countries that you wouldn't expect, from Pakistan and India, from Ukraine and Russia, from from Palestine and Israel, because they, are share, they share this same common spirit that knowledge should be available to all. And we do it with the support of allies. So this is an image of the Metropolitan Museum. It's the third largest, uh, what they call encyclopedic museum in the world after the Louvre and the British Museum. And it is one of our greatest institutional partners at Wikimedia. They have donated their entire collection of 1.3 million articles, the images of those articles, to Wikimedia Commons. They made them available in the public domain and have been working with us to bring that entire collection online to enrich the content that exists in Wikipedia through multimedia experience. And of course, it's not just the Metropolitan Museum. We work very closely with Europeana here in the EU in order to be able to bring the, tech, the texture and culture of Europe into Wikimedia. And we're looking to expand these partnerships all across the world, as I said, with galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, the traditional holders of our heritage, because these holders of our heritage and culture and learning are the ones who have developed over the years such a strong commitment and public service mission. We share that same sort of identity and public service mission. The difference is, is that we have a billion people coming through our front doors every single month. And so what we want to do is to be able to find ways to bring their mission to the public and the public to their missions. And it's all made possible by people as well. If it's built by people and supported by people, it's made possible by people. This is a, it's a rough slide. It's an image of our fundraising totals over the course of the year. Don't focus on the dollar amounts. That's not why I'm putting it here in front of you. What I wanted to really convey is this idea that everyone from all over the globe participates in making Wikipedia possible. We're, we receive donations from about 6 million people every single year, with the average donation being about 50 15 US dollars. That means that Wikipedia is able to stay completely independent because it's been supported by the public. And because we don't own any of our content, you've heard probably a lot about open source earlier today and open licensing. Everything on Wikipedia, from the software being open source to the content being open licensed, it actually doesn't belong to us. It belongs to you. It belongs to the world. And then it's, so it's built by the world. It belongs to the world. And I think what's really special about it is that it's supported by the world. So if you count yourself among the supporters of Wikipedia, I just want to say thank you very much. As I mentioned already, it's all free and open. We're a non-commercial organization. And we believe that openness should be open as in open to use, free to use, but also free as in free to repurpose and to remix. If you wanted to print Wikipedia out and sell it, be my guest. It'd be a lot of books. <laughs> And the reason we do this, as I mentioned, is because we truly believe that it makes the world a better place, that we share, when we share knowledge, we share a common shared foundation, and it allows us to have better societies, more educated societies, because education is more accessible, equitable, and relevant when it's built and created by all, more informed societies, the basis upon which we can make good decisions, more democratic societies, hopefully societies that are more open and pluralistic and 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 with the resources to determine how they want to be governed. More sustainable societies with more opportunity and in, more opportunity that empowers people to make their own decisions and in, to create their own livelihoods. And as I said, because we do share this vision, we actually see ourselves in a long line of communities of the curious, from scientists who developed the scientific method, this idea that when information comes along, you should actually change your opinion. Well, Wikipedia believes that too, to academics who engage in the diligent process of research and review. Much of how Wikipedia works is based on the premise that when you put information out there to many eyes, it allows for people with similar levels of expertise to come in and correct and improve your work. 
and as I said, technology is what makes it all possible at scale. You know, technology has, has demolished many of the barriers that we have in order in, excuse me, many of our barriers to communication and connection. So what we do in terms of distributing knowledge, if we tried to do it in books and take it along roads and get it into everyone's homes would never be possible. But because of technology, it's created an opportunity for us to reach so many more people. Of course, technology in and of itself, and this is starts to get into what I want to talk to you a little bit about today, is not good or bad, as, as Marvin, Melvin Kranzberg said. I think this is his third law of technology. It's not neutral either. It's all about the way in which we use it. And so at Wikimedia and in the open community, we've been having conversations lately about what are our goals to Wiki for in terms of how technology is used. Earlier this year, the World Wide Web, World Wide Web Foundation, excuse me, uh, which is the organization set up by Sir Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web, found made the determination that this is the year in which more than 50% of people will be online. He also they also made the determination that the time it will take for everybody on the planet to be connected in some sort of way is 2042. And so Sir Tim Berners-Lee issued a letter asking us the web that we want today, the web that has 50% of the planet on it, what is it going to look like by 2042? And will we actually even want to be a part of it given sort of the state of, of, of the world? It's a dark place, perhaps. It's an unhappy place, perhaps. It's a place where you don't have much privacy in which you don't necessarily trust the information that's being shown to you. It's a place in which currently today it drives us away from each other rather than towards each other and puts us into silos where we hear the same echo chambers of our own opinions. But we think at Wikimedia that, oh no, something, uh, ah, the 2042 could also be a much brighter space, um, a place in which there's an opportunity for us to come together and actually think about the web that we want, the open space that we want, and define openness on our own terms. We think that some of the most exciting initiatives actually happen when you gather people together. We think that when you include, when you build for a web that is open and inclusive and really intentional in the way that it engages people and lowers the barriers to participation and access, you end up with projects like Wikipedia. You end up with projects that are in the public trust because they are served by the public trust and they are accountable to the public trust. In fact, some of these edge cases are what are responsible for projects like Wikidata, which is our open linked and structured data platform. It's my belief that Wikidata is actually the future of what we do, and it wasn't created by us at the Wikimedia Foundation. It was created by our colleagues at Wikimedia Deutschland. Wikidata is the free knowledge base that accounts for half of all of our edits today and has 50 mil, almost 50 almost 51 million unique items in it. And we believe that what Wikidata offers is a way to take the world and all of its messiness and create linked and structured concepts that help connect and identify concepts across societies, across languages and cultures, but not just within Wikipedia in ways that actually allow us to connect to national libraries, to different archives, to scientific institutions, because as it turns out, having a structured way of thinking about the world is something that's valuable to so many more than just Wikipedians. And for us, Wikidata is just really the beginning. We think that this is something that will allow all concepts when <laughs> Sorry, we think it's something that will allow us to connect to institutions and really think about elevating and connecting a web that is formed on knowledge, a web that allows 2042 to be something that is a bright and shining future rather than that dark future that we worry about. And the thing that was so exciting to us as well is that it's something that can bring together a network of institutions that already share in this mission, whether it's your institutions and the work that you do or the institutions that have yet to emerge, and actually think about releasing and creating uh, the promise of the web as it was meant to be, a web for creators, a web for learning, a web for education, as opposed to just one in which, I'm not going to say cat videos again. <laughs> Um, and we think that this actually leads us to a more resilient and inclusive digital commons, one in which institutions of culture and government and, and education and science can actually collaborate together with a greater benefit to all. 
this is the dedication that we've had over the years. I know many of you in this room are already thinking about this. I know that Switzerland in particular is a country that has led the way in terms of thinking about what open participatory government can look like. When I got in yesterday, I had a lovely evening talking about what truly it means to have a place in which you can participate in direct democracy. There are many sort of historical traditions that point the way forward, and that's why it's so exciting to be here in this room right now. We think of this element of coordination, collaboration, participation, and confederation as something that is actually true to the spirit of Wikimedia, but also creates us and points us to a world in which we want to be a part of. We think it's an audacious an audacious goal, sorry, I'm not sure what that side was supposed to be, an audacious goal to connect the world through knowledge and through data, but I actually think it's not enough to just connect what exists. What I wanted to say is that I think what we need to be doing is connecting not just exists, but looking to what hasn't been is, doesn't exist in the world yet today, looking to the geographies and languages and communities and histories that have been left out, and then actively going and seeking them out in order to bring them into our shared knowledge space. If we want a web that is actually reflective of all and open to all and participatory for all, then it needs to be a web that actually reflects the culture of the world, not just those of us who are involved in its early creation in Europe and in North America. And that's something that we at Wikimedia care very passionately about, because the world is changing and because the population centers that have made us strong and made the web strong are actually in decline and because the population centers that are going to point the way forward over the next century are the ones that are growing. By the end of 2100, that is to say less than 100 years from now, 42% of the world's population is going to live on the continent of Africa. So the world that we know today is a world that's going to look fundamentally different to anything that we have experienced, and we think that this is a tremendous opportunity. We think that this is a really exciting moment in time, and it's one in which education and access to information are more important than ever. We're beginning to finally understand how our connected societies can actually drive accessibility and drive creativity and participation. And as I said, it comes with this responsibility as well, because I'm not sure I want to live in a society in which everyone walks around with these glasses on their heads. <laughs> We recognize that our, our institutions, though, are fragile. And so as we think about the future of knowledge, we really also need to be investing in its sustainability. It's not enough for us to simply build a resource and think that it will be around for forever. As we know, the world is changing quite rapidly, and the conditions in which we operate are constantly in flux. We think that the commons itself, is, as rapidly as we are building it, is also in falling into the risk of being endangered. Because the commons that we have built is increasingly one that people take for granted, like the web itself. It's for hard for us to remember that 20 years ago, knowledge wasn't available on our finger, at our fingertips, and today it is. And yet, at the same time, the way that the web has been changing over time means that those same values that gave birth to projects like Wikipedia and open source, a truly collaborative and open moment, are also under threat. So what I would ask of all of you is that this is the moment for participation. This is the moment for you to be engaged. We have agency to think about how we want to build our future. We have agency to think about what knowledge should be and how we invite others to participate in it. This is a moment of reflection as we think about who controls the information, who controls the infrastructure, and what it is that we want as we citizens, as we people, not users, not users, but as citizens and people, what is it that we want out of our information society? As I said, we want a world in which every single human can freely share in the sum of all knowledge. That's the vision statement. That's the powerful animating principle upon which Wikipedia works. And it's the thing that has brought all these millions of people together over the years. But what I find so beautiful about this mission statement is it says nothing about us. It doesn't say Wikimedia. It doesn't even say Wikipedia. It imagines a world in which every single human can freely share in the sum of all knowledge, which means that anybody who shares this vision can join us. And so I'm inviting all of you here to participate in this creation so that anyone can access anything. Because we're building it for ourselves, certainly, but we're also building it for the next generation. I know they're so cute, aren't they? Uh, we're building it for the next generation. And this is a generation that is going to inherit what it is that we have built, for good or for bad. This is a generation that in 2042 will point the way to our future world. And we want this to be the generation that has at its fingertips all of the richest things that it could possibly have.
of, all of the learnings that we've created in the past so that they can continue to stand on the shoulders of giants and build even better for future generations to come. Thank you. Wow. You do paint quite a, a beautiful vision for the future. I hope it works I out. I hope it's that beautiful. Way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'll see. Maybe that's something that we could we could talk about. We do have a couple of minutes um, left before the break, and then uh, the uh, actually the lightning talks, and then the break. And um, I have a couple of questions in case no one from the audience has one, but I'm sure I'm sure the audience has a couple of questions to ask. Um, Matthias has the microphone. Ihr könnt sonst auch auf Deutsch fragen und ich übersetze. Das geht auch. Yeah, thank you, uh, Katharine. My, my name is Torben. Uh, my question is, one, one of the first thing you learn at university is not to quote Wikipedia. <laughs> so I would be really interested in your opinion on that. Thank you. Uh, one of the first things that I learned when I was a student before Wikipedia existed is you shouldn't quote encyclopedias in general. An encyclopedia is a tertiary source, and research should be based on primary and secondary sources. So what we would say is use Wikipedia as a jumping off point. Use it as a place to start learning. It's a great place to start, but it's a terrible place to finish if you really want to understand a subject. But it is fortunate because it has all those wonderful citations at the bottom. So think of it as a trail map to where you want to go. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Eddie. Um, I, I would like to know what do you do so th that the information can't be blocked by governments and like how, how, how is the information technically distributed and, and uh, is it possible to take Wikipedia down quite <laughs> easily? Say, if, 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 yeah, I, I do see knowledge under threat in a way and there's many people unfortunately interested in taking knowledge down what what are the countermeasures yeah i think that um one of the things that i like to say is that if wikipedia feels like an encyclopedia to you you probably live in a place where information is very safe because in many places in the world the very act of accessing open knowledge or knowledge that's meant to be truthful actually is a very radical or almost a political act. Um, and we see this with our global communities all over the globe. At the moment, Wikipedia is blocked in Turkey and it is blocked in China. Um, and I think that at the foundation, one of the things that we invest in is thinking about how we can prevent that from happening in other places. One of the things that we do to protect our users' uh, safety is we use a, um, SSL encryption to ensure that when you're browsing on Wikipedia, people can't look at what it is that you're reading. But that also means that if a government doesn't like the content on Wikipedia, they have to shut, in order to block a single article, they block the entire site. That's the way that it, the architecture of the security works. And we've made the decision as the Wikimedia Foundation that we do not take down or alter content because of political pressure. So I think this is something that we genuinely feel is a risk at the moment and may only become a greater risk as what we think of as open societies continue to become more closed. Um, so this is, I don't have an answer for that. I think that that's an answer that is something that we should all be invested in, is understanding why it feels the world is generally turning away from open flows of information into closed and um, contentious flows of information. But it's something that we as Wikimedia actually believe that our, our responsibility is not just to resist this trend, but actually to point a path to the future, uh, which is that shared commitment to knowledge for everyone. Hi, Catherine. I'm Simon. I'm an editor on the uh, English Wikipedia. Hi, Simon. <laughs> and have been for about 20 years. Uh, it, I find that the Wikipedia editor community is very challenging to engage in. Mm. Uh, and I've uh, twice had to change my identity on Wikipedia to avoid harassment. I wonder what steps you're taking to make it a place where the the natural instincts of anonymous human beings are expressed through bad things. Yeah. <laughs> 
I, I appreciate the question. Um, I think one of the challenges that we've seen with this is Simon's absolutely right in, in articulating that the internet in general, and Wikipedia as well, can be a place in which participation is fraught and difficult. One thing that we have found that is a little bit different compared to other social sites is that um, harassment looks different on our sites. Uh, it's usually very smart people out intellecting each other as opposed to very nasty people swearing at each other. And so the tools that we have to address that have to be more sophisticated. Uh, we have an anti-harassment team that is working on looking at the way that we can change the underlying software solutions. And we have a team that has been looking at what we need to do from a policy standpoint, as well as a team that is invested in training Wikipedia editors to better understand understand and know how to deal with harassment. We did a survey that found that 97% of Wikipedia editors know how to handle vandalism, and only 36% felt like they knew how to handle harassment when they saw it. So we view this as a community issue, it's a human issue, it's a, a policy issue, and it's a, it's a technical issue, and we have, we're working on all three of those things right now. I'm sorry you've had that experience. I um, slightly uh, remember reading an article titled uh, Wikipedia has cancer, uh, which in summary says uh, Wikipedia is uh, collecting more money than it's uh, spending. Uh, what, how do you see the, the current state of this? Um, so Wikipedia is a non or the Wikimedia Foundation is a not-for-profit. We're a non-commercial charitable institution. And every year we budget for the year that we're going to need, which is primarily operating the technical infrastructure and supporting the communities as well as doing ad some advocacy work. And then we raise money uh, in the course of the year. And it is true that some years we raise more money than we're able to spend. What we do with that money is that we invest it in our endowment which is meant to be a way to protect Wikipedia over the long term. Because we rely on individual donor donations, we every single year we have to raise the budget, and we have about a year's worth of protection should that fail. And so what we're looking at is creating a resource that means that if the funding cycles change or if, heaven forbid, there's some sort of calamity like another global financial crisis or collapse, that Wikipedia will be able to continue to operate even if we don't have, aren't able to raise a budget. So for us, we view it as a shared responsibility to maintaining the sites today, but also protecting them into the future and just being a um, financially responsible institution. Hi, thank you. My name is Urban, and I, I don't know how long it was, how much time ago it was, but I had friends that edited articles and then were quite attacked because it was, there were articles about multinationals and they have much more power to pay people. And then there was a, a new policy that people that edit and are paid for, they have to announce it. And I, in the last time, I didn't hear much about it, so I wanted to ask, like, does this work? Did this change a lot or a little? Sure. So what you're referring to is, as you can imagine, being one of the most popular websites on the planet makes us a battleground for both good and evil, I guess, if you want to call it that, or good and bad, or just human nature. Um, and there is a whole industry of people who edit Wikipedia for pay and do things like make politicians' articles more friendly or um, improve the the, improve the quality of a content about a corporation. And we believe that when you do that for pay, that actually is contrary to the spirit of what Wikipedia is meant to be, and we call it what's called black hat editing. It's a violation of our policies. Uh, so we did make a very clear change so that when people do that, they are in violation and, and it's possible for the community to kick them off the sites. Uh, what we're doing right now is investing in how we can 
detect that more easily from a technical perspective to be able to protect our editors so that they're not constantly in conflict. Um, the, we see these things come up periodically and we just believe it's very harmful to free knowledge when people are pushing paid agendas because it empowers those who have resources against those who don't. Hello, my name is Christian. Um, I experienced that during the last years, actually, the articles became too excellent. They are too detailed, which on the other hand means if I just want to look up something and I just want to know the basics of it, I simply cannot get the basics anymore because it's just the articles are too long. So do you have any plans like providing what I call a, a dummy version of, of a topic? Are there any, any plans you have? Uh, Christian, Christian, right? Yes. Um, I have this problem too. I went to look up the article on quantum computing recently and I had to... <laughs> I had to read the article on simple English Wikipedia, which is meant for people who don't speak English as their native language. So I know the feeling, and it's actually an issue of constant debate. Uh, when you describe, for example, the chemical composition of water, do you say water is a life source that nourishes all of us on Earth, or do you say it's H2O, and that's two, you know... Um, two hydrogens and an oxygen. Um, so we, we do, we are familiar with this problem. Uh, one of the ways that we've been looking at trying to address it from a technical perspective is to be able to more easily take things like summaries of articles and present them instead of the deep technical knowledge that exists so that we have more modular modular ways of presenting information and I, we can see a future in which you might be able to say look up water and see images of water and then a very short description or hopefully quantum computing whatever I don't know what a short description of quantum computing looks like is um, but we know that on one hand we have incredible resources on science and technology and on the other hand they're completely impenetrable to a generalist like me so it's an issue and, and we are trying to figure out how to how to let those two things exist in one place maybe thank time you. for one more question okay Thank you for information. Um, my name is Miriam. My question goes to the direction that women in India are much more connected to Wikipedia. They are much more giving in, in substance, and Swiss women don't. Do you have an explanation for this? Yeah, it is an issue for Wikimedia and Wikipedia that women are much, much, much less likely to contribute than men. Uh, between 80 to 90% of our contributors are men and only about 10 to 20 are women, depending on language. Um, we think there's a number of reasons for this. Uh, one is, is the issue that Simon raised, which is it's often a environment that is, can be contentious. And what our research has shown is that women like uh, have seem to like to work together in more cooperative, collaborative learning environments rather than contentious environments. And so we're doing some research right now as to how we might work on changing some of those dynamics. Um, another one that we've identified is that in many places, women just don't have access to technology in the same way. Even if a household has access to technology, it might be technology that's primarily um, controlled or utilized by, by the males in the household. Uh, the really significant one is that women have less leisure time than men. Uh, it is the case that even in, even in Western uh, liberal democracies, um, women often essentially are performing two jobs, right? Both working in the home and working outside of the home and have less free time to contribute. We've seen that problem as well. Um, and I think that these are... These, this creates issues because it means that the content that exists on Wikipedia is not as reflective of 50% of the world's population as we would like it to be. And so what we've found is that um, in particular participation is much greater when we do offline participation. So between 30 to 40% of participants in community organizing events and outreach are women. And so we're looking at how we can invest in community off offline participation and social engagements as as a way of creating a shift in balance. And I think that that's, I'd be very interested um, to connect you after to our Swiss community, which has also been looking at these issues, specifically here in Switzerland.
Yeah, just as a quick add-on, on on the 15th of November, there's going to be an edit-a-thon. Yes. Yeah, um, and it's specifically targeted towards um, articles about women. So there was just a case of uh, a Nobel Prize winner who had been on Wikipedia but then kicked off. The article had been kicked off because someone said it wasn't relevant enough, etc. So there's this whole issue, uh, the two angles of like representation and what's represented on Wikipedia itself. That's it. right. Yeah. So there's going to be an edit-a-thon on the 15th of November here in Switzerland. If I may add, the, the, the positive of all that negative attention was last, last week or the week before last was the best week for participation writing about women in the history of our time tracking it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so okay. that's good. <laughs> wow. <Okay. Yeah. laughs> um, speaking of history, so thank you very much for the question. Thank you so much. Um, I think you might have heard we're going to have a little celebration afterwards. It's 20 years open source initiative. So it's afterwards at five o'clock, there's going to be a little celebration. How old is Wikipedia now? I can't remember. We're going to turn 18 in January. 18, so Okay. Yeah. End of the teenager years then. So <laughs> almost the same age. I'm, I'm, I think, I'm not sure I'd give us a car, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we would be happy if you would join us. I look forward to it. Thank you. Uh, and then maybe some more questions will come up. And Absolutely. thank you so much for oh, sharing thank you. everything with My us. My pleasure. Thank you so much With for listening. This community, and please do participate. And um, yeah, thank you very much Absolutely. for coming. Thank you. Thank you.